Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Sorting Out the Acronym Soup, CASB, SASE, SCAPE, and SDP. This is the second episode of our Beyond SASE, SCAPE research series. I'm John Burke, CTO at Nemertes. I'd like to encourage you to submit questions, any that come up along the way, and we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers. We'll answer as many questions as we can during that period. And uh, again, please submit them as they occur to you through the Q&A panel uh, here in Bright Talk. With that, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So just what everybody was waiting for, time to show some slides. We'll start with a quick introduction to Nemertes for those of you who are not familiar with us, and then a word about the research study uh, from which the data shown here and in the rest of the series uh, derive. We'll then dig into what we mean by SCAPE and the untangling of the acronyms that will be key to uh, understanding the rest of what's going on in the series. And we'll look quickly at the adoption of key technologies in the SCAPE envelope. We'll wrap it up with some takeaways and that promised Q&A period. And again, please submit questions whenever they occur to you. For those of you who are not familiar with Nemertes, we are a research and strategic advisory firm, and we're focused on understanding the business value that companies derive from deploying emerging technologies. Uh, our main focus is that enterprise impact, and our main uh, method of determining that is by conducting research studies uh, where we uh, combine uh, interviewing IT professionals, uh, such as the folks attending this, and uh, surveying them to build a bigger data set. And in this current research study, SCAPE 2021, uh, we collected data from 157 firms through a combination of uh, interviewing, uh, surveying friendly companies, those that we've uh, either worked with or interviewed in the past, and surveying a broader population. Uh, we restricted it to uh, the US. We actually got a couple of entries from Canada as well. So officially there are two countries in the data set uh, across 31 separate vertical industries. Uh, on average, the companies range medium large, uh, roughly 6,000 employees on average, uh, a little under $2 billion in annual revenue, again, on average. And because we're collecting all this kind of detailed information from the participants, we can slice and dice any of the other kinds of data that we're collecting by company size, by company vertical. It's the kind of stuff we do for our clients regularly. So what do we mean by SCAPE? The, the whole study was called SCAPE. What do we mean? We mean secure cloud access and policy enforcement. What's that? Uh, well, uh, as is easily apparent from the blob diagram on the chart, uh, SCAPE is a superset of SASE that includes uh, EDR and XDR as well as optionally SDP and of course IAM as a service. And because it's a superset of SASE, it can include other centralized security solutions than just the secure web gateway as a service as is shown here, uh, i.e. things like DLP as a service or NGFW as a service. And well, um, tell you what, uh, yeah. That was an awfully large number of acronyms in an awfully small space. And in any conversation in this security space, the acronym soup gets pretty thick and heavy. And it's unclear what people mean some of the time when they're using different acronyms in different contexts. So we wanted to devote this piece of the webinar series to untangling and explaining the acronyms and how they all fit together in our picture of the security space, which is SCAPE. Uh, and uh, that's what we're going to proceed to do. And we'll start uh, out at the edge with EDR, Endpoint Detection and Response. And this is uh, a relatively new name for a not quite as new concept, uh, which is to use endpoints in the organization. So laptops, desktops, uh, even phones, if you're lucky, as uh, security sensors to help detect and even respond to uh, emerging cybersecurity threats. It, it, uh, an EDR type client can include traditional endpoint protection elements like anti-malware or more advanced endpoint protection like uh, sandboxing and 
um, micro virtualization, but the key is to be able to provide intelligence about what's going on and potentially to be able to push policy down at the machine to affect uh, how the EDR client is allowing traffic to flow. Uh, there are many examples of EDR clients in the space. Uh, several of them are listed here on the slide. Uh, there are more all the time as uh, folks in the traditional space uh, upgrade their activities into uh, these newer aspects of functionality. And one of the things that we saw in our research is that uh, the folks who uh, are using an EDR client that incorporates that endpoint protection functionality, things like anti-malware and host firewalling, uh, those folks are in fact more successful uh, in their cybersecurity efforts than those who use uh, separate clients or only the EDR and not the endpoint protection. One of the big topics of discussion in the security uh, space currently is uh, EDR as it pertains to XDR, extended detection and response. Uh, the idea being that uh, all that great uh, information that's coming from the endpoints via EDR about what's happening on them and through them uh, needs to go somewhere in order to really serve the purposes of the enterprise and an XDR system is a great option for that because XDR is uh, basically behavioral threat analytics that are focused on uh, collecting data from a broad set of sources including EDR but also more traditional uh, uh, syslog or simsem or seam uh, data feeds and uh, cloud services like CASBs or SWGs as a service. Uh, any of them can be feeding their data into uh, the XDR system where it will be uh, combined ideally with uh, threat intelligence coming from outside the organization. So from the uh, XDR vendor or from some impartial third party, sometimes that's a professional organization or even a government body uh, about what threats currently look like, what new threats have been detected uh, and are emerging. Uh, all those things get put together with the behavioral data that's provided by EDR and other systems and uh, is analyzed for threats and uh, feeds out a stream of essentially threat scoring information saying, yes, uh, this is acceptable behavior or uh, not unexpected behavior. And no, uh, that is not just unexpected behavior, but um, dangerously anomalous and needs to be shut down. And that can then turn into action uh, from the EDR uh, client systems or from other systems in the security envelope. Uh, so those threat scores flow out and influence uh, actual protective measures that are being uh, implemented by other pieces of the infrastructure. Uh, we include identity and access management as a service uh, because uh, controlling uh, who has access to your systems by being able to certify that they are who they say they are uh, is critical to every other aspect of providing this outward facing security uh, that so many of these technologies are focused on and cloud-based uh, identity and access management uh, is the uh, emerging preferred method for integrating uh, IAM across cloud and internal systems and providing that uh, single source of truth that the enterprise can then use to control access to its systems and services. Uh, again, lots of uh, candidates in the field um, and uh, lots of options. Most organizations have not yet settled into a single one. Uh, I believe uh, it was fewer than a quarter used a single solution uh, exclusively. About 75% of organizations uh, use uh, Microsoft as their primary service. And uh, yes, only about 22% of them use Microsoft only. Uh, hardly anybody used anything else exclusively. Uh, so. Uh, identity and access management services are, are crucial and uh, need to be integrated into the envelope uh, for things like uh, cloud access. Security. And uh, one of the main avenues for that is via a, a cloud access security broker. And this is a cloud service uh, that provides for both uh, visibility into use of cloud services and policy enforcement on the use 
of cloud services. Uh, and it does this in one of two modes. Uh, it can either be sitting in line uh, in between uh, an end user and the service they're trying to access, or it can be sitting uh, off to the side and talking to the cloud service and providing information about who should be allowed to log in and who shouldn't, and collecting information about who has logged in and who hasn't, and what they are doing inside that cloud environment. Uh, and uh, this is crucial for cybersecurity staff to be able to regain some of the visibility they have typically lost when services have moved into cloud environments. And uh, again, CASBs, uh, like other kinds of cloud services, can be applied in line uh, or uh, in, in API mode from the side uh, for monitoring access to services running inside a private cloud as well. Uh, and so, uh, again, they look to become the uh, primary mode, the primary method by which enterprises uh, monitor and secure access to cloud resources. Although there is some competition uh, in that space, as we'll be seeing uh, from other kinds of solutions, or at least solutions functioning other uh, under other uh, market definitions or market terms, uh, but providing kind of functionally the same things. Uh, we've talked a little bit about secure web gateways as a service, at least to the extent of expanding that acronym earlier. Um, but uh, a secure web gateway, uh, as traditionally envisioned, is uh, a service through which uh, your protected users from their uh, company desktops or laptops uh, reach out to access things on the big internet. So they're not going to a sanctioned SaaS server, you know, not going to Salesforce or Microsoft 365. They are instead going out to the rest of the internet. And uh, there are uh, things out there that we know are 99% are okay. They're going to ESPN. That's not likely to infect them with anything. And there are things out there that are known to be bad, uh, lots and lots of lists of no-go sites, no-go IP addresses, no-go domain names, uh, stuff that your folks definitely should not be going to from their work machines. Uh, and then there's a whole lot of uh, other sites out there whose uh, goodness or badness is not known in advance because they're basically being gone to for the first time or they've recently popped up or they just haven't uh, risen to the top of anybody's security attention list. Uh, and the secure web gateways function is to uh, block access to the things that are known bad, monitor access to anything that uh, is, is actually allowed to be used and to provide real-time scanning and blocking of things like uh, malware that might be riding in uh, from content coming back from a site that's not known to be bad. And the site itself may not be bad. It may simply have a, a bad piece of content uploaded to it. Uh, so somebody's downloading a document, the document's infected with something, the site is otherwise clean and known okay. So uh, the Secure Web Gateway is there to be a filter for access to the internet both outgoing, preventing you from going to things that the company knows are dangerous, and incoming blocking content uh, that the company knows is dangerous or that the, the, the solution knows is dangerous. This used to be done with boxes in the data center or in the internet points of presence. Uh, it, it is shifting rapidly into the cloud, and uh, you know services like Zscaler have made this the foundation of their business and expanded in other directions. Um, it's something that more naturally fits in the cloud for a lot of reasons, uh, having to do both with um, uh, optimization of uh, uh, connectivity, why consume enterprise bandwidth sending into your data centers traffic that is you know, gonna be blocked, it's known to be bad, uh, and because of the ability to dynamically scale uh, when something comes down and needs to be analyzed closely, maybe through multiple tiers of analysis, uh, a cloud solution can spin up the resources to do that and then spin them back down during the idle periods, uh, something that that box in your data center is not so good at. So secure web gateways as a service, a major component of the security landscape going forward, lots of options out there, and uh, again, more coming regularly as uh, traditional vendors move into the cloud and adjacent cloud vendors pick up functionality in this space. 
So SASE, Secure Access Service Edge, is a subject of enormous amounts of uh, market uh, uh, babble right now. It, it is the uh, most hyped term out there right now and the one driving the largest amount of product rebranding and rebadging uh, as it is um, it, essentially a, a marketing term that was developed to try to wrap an envelope around a broad set of security technologies, including ones we've just been talking about, not including things like EDR and XDR, uh, but including things like CASB functionality. That, that's one of the potential core services of a SASE solution. I say potential because, of course, it's not a rigidly required piece of SASE functionality. It is, it is simply something that is uh, expected <laughs> um, and would make a lot of sense, but not required. You can still call yourself a SASE solution even with that big hole in the services you provide. Uh, likewise, uh, that actual secure access uh, functionality whereby uh, either branch offices or individual users or devices uh, connect to a point of presence that is, you know, internet near them, someplace a very short distance away in terms of internet latency. Uh, and then from there uh, are connected via a secured backbone uh, into their re enterprise resources, whether it's their own data centers or stuff in sanctioned IaaS or SaaS platforms or some egress point to the big internet. And that connectivity amongst the points of presence and the destinations uh, is the focus of security functionality like CASB, like Secure Web Gateway. Uh, and so the, the SASE solution should encompass securing and monitoring access to your sanctioned cloud services, securing and monitoring access to the big internet, and providing access back into your own data centers and the services that are still resident there. And you know that's still roughly 30% of resources. So that's sort of what SASE means. But again, remember, because it's a super hyped term, uh, the definition as, as uh, inexact but indicative as it was originally uh, is being stretched in every direction to try and accommodate whatever products a, a vendor happens to have that are close to fitting or that fit exactly, but maybe don't cover completely the envelope of expected functionality. It's all getting painted blue and, and slapped with a, a sassy label at the moment. And you know, in the face of that, um, uh, we had a lot of discussions at Demerties about whether to continue to use our own acronyms or to adopt the SASE one. We, we have ultimately adopted SASE to talk about some functionality uh, and held on to our own in an expanded sense to try and convey what's missing. Um, one of the things that's missing, uh, not really contemplated much in the SASE architecture, uh, is the software-defined perimeter. It, it's a potential solution for zero trust network access, which is potentially a part of the SASE solution set, um, uh, but it, it's generally uh, not incorporated in the conversation and the focus is instead on uh, other kinds of solutions to the zero trust network access problem. But a software defined perimeter is a, a, a relatively old concept. The definition goes back into the 2000s and a, a well-defined concept. There actually is a, a definitional architecture from the Cloud Security Alliance, uh, and the focus is on uh, actual zero trust in the network uh, and controlled by a central policy engine, but enforced at the uh, endpoint or uh, access level. So uh, something wants to talk to something else, the policy engine is going to say, yes, you can, or no, you can't. Uh, and uh, the uh, entities involved, the desktops, the, the servers, uh, are going to drop at the network stack level, going to drop packets that they're not supposed to pay any attention to. So nothing will rise to the application layer uh, if it's not coming from someplace it's supposed to come from. Uh, via the channels it's supposed to come in. So that, that policy engine is critical, uh, and this is true across any kind of real zero trust architecture, that central policy engine that an, an administrative uh, 
process can use to determine whether a conversation should take place. That's central to SDP, as is enforcement at the network level of decisions that are made by that policy administration engine. And that can be right on the hosts, as I've said, or in some cases, uh, a gateway host can be set in between uh, the larger network and a set of service providing en entities on the back end. Um, and uh, it can be the enforcement point and things won't uh, get past its network stack to go in and uh, try and touch the, the actual service providing hosts on the other side. So uh, SDPs are great for stopping lateral attacks inside uh, a corporate environment cold. Um, basically, if, if a system isn't supposed to talk to another system, uh, it can't. And it can't even see that other system. And that other system can't see it and won't respond to packets coming from it. Uh, it, it it's, uh, it's called a black network because like the, the starless parts of the sky, uh, it just, there's nothing visible there uh, when, when there's not supposed to be. So uh, there are a number of SDP solutions in the space, some more mature than others, some more uh, uh, true to the definition of SDP that the Cloud Security Alliance puts out than others, uh, but there are uh, more entries coming in as time goes by. And uh, one of the key uh, considerations in looking at SDPs is whether you want to be protecting things inside your data center as well as things in cloud environments or with the same security envelopes. And then uh, whether you need to deploy uh, server type infrastructure, the policy engine, the policy administrator inside your environment to make that happen, or whether it can be mediated by some kind of cloud or edge deployment. Uh, those are all considerations when deploying an SDP. Uh, and there are a lot of other ones uh, having to do more with institutional knowledge and your ability to say who needs to talk to what. Uh, in, in interviewing SDP users, uh, many of them found that uh, they were uh, taking more care than they ever had before in providing uh, credentials to users because they now had a simple and centralized way of controlling what those users would have uh, credentials for. So instead of giving everybody network level access to everything and then at the application layer controlling what they could uh, see or, or get into, uh, controlling at the network level what they would even be able to connect to. Uh, and doing it in a more granular and thoughtful fashion. So uh, it's been transformative for those kinds of enterprises and really uh, changed how they secure their enterprise. So with all that in mind, scape, let's revisit it. Uh, blah, 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 mumble, mumble, super set of sassy. So uh, trying to show here graphically the idea that it is uh, like a superset of SASE in that it expands on the SASE idea to include uh, EDR and SDP, that it expands on the SASE concept to include XDR, uh, behavioral threat analytics, because that is critical to an enterprise's ability to provide uh, real-time dynamic security against real-time dynamically evolving threats. Basically, you need to be able to watch what folks uh, what systems, what devices, what servers, uh, what users are doing on your network and notice when something suddenly goes haywire and they start trying to access systems they haven't in the past and aren't supposed to, or a system starts trying to uh, communicate urgently with Russia or North Korea, um, all, all sorts of anomalous behaviors uh, that become visible only well after a system has been admitted to the network and has been working on the network normally. Uh, so behavioral threat analytics, crucial to scape uh, in that uh, larger sense and uh, that extension to the desktop or endpoint environment with EDR, crucial to the idea of scape and encompassing SDP explicitly as an alternative to private POPs uh, as, again, a key part of SCAPE. It's one of those critical design alternatives that can dramatically affect how an enterprise chooses not just to secure access to its backend systems, but even how to provide networking to its branch sites. Uh, we have spoken with folks who uh, essentially scrapped private backbone connectivity 
a private WAN connectivity to some of their edge sites, a lot of their edge sites, as soon as they had an SDP solution in place, and it was all either SDP back into the data center or uh, via a CASB out into sanctioned cloud or via a, a secure web gateway uh, out into the big internet. So they, they just didn't need the WAN connectivity anymore back into the data centers, uh, given usage patterns and how they were evolving and that uh, ultra secure SDP connectivity to their internal resources. So uh, that's what we're really talking about when we talk about SCAPE. It's this kind of big picture. It's all these kinds of solutions brought together under a common management interface uh, as much as possible, or at least a common management framework uh, in the security environment and a common policy framework. Uh, and of course, as many integrations across products from different vendors as possible. So overall, we see that, and it's no surprise, that uh, IAM as a service is the most broadly deployed of the uh, Keyscape technologies, and that endpoint detection and response is quickly climbing to match it. Not a huge surprise. Again, it's a rapid evolution in the field and the uh, lifespan of uh, specific endpoint protection project uh, products is such that the, the turnover from old line uh, endpoint protection client to new line combined uh, protection and detection and response client uh, is happening pretty rapidly as folks uh, age out of their older contracts. Uh, CASB is already in use by more than half of the organizations in the research and uh, set to rise pretty dramatically in the next 18 months. Uh, Secure Web Gateway is a service just shy of 50% and again rising rapidly. Uh, extended detection and response, so that behavioral threat analytics piece, uh, lagging further behind these other pieces, not rising as quickly as these other pieces, but inevitably going to be required for organizations that want to maintain uh, real security in the face of uh, rapidly evolving threats and uh, zero day attacks. Uh, SASE, relatively new market term, uh, we were looking specifically for folks who were acquiring solutions uh, under the SASE rubric. So they were buying a SASE solution from a vendor and uh, shy of 40% of companies say they're doing that. Now, a lot of those have been uh, essentially expansions around some other existing product, uh, a secure web gateway or a secure access product and things have been added to it and it's been turned into a SASE product. Uh, and uh, what we found was that most of the folks who said they were using a SASE solution from a vendor were using only one or two of the key components. And uh, actually, um, CASB was the number one piece. So SASE solutions that included a CASB, um, that was the most broadly deployed. Like 60% of uh, SASE users said they were using their SASE vendors CASB. Uh, about 40% were using their secure web gateway, about 40% using the secure access functionality. Uh, least adopted so far with just over a quarter, uh, less than a third of organizations adopting software defined perimeter products. But because we're in a zero trust moment in the market, uh, as well as a SASE moment, because SDP is zero trust network access, uh, because so much effort has been expended in the last year on securing remote access. Uh, we see that the uh, interest in SDP is rising rapidly and we expect adoption to rise rapidly over the next 18 months or so as well. So coming up next time, we'll be talking uh, specifically about best practices in the SCAPE environment and uh, about how adoption and deployment of different technologies or different practices correlates with success in uh, providing these kinds of services for the enterprise. If you didn't catch episode one of this series, it was about that success metric. Uh, you can see it there on the right-hand column, the SIPI, the serious incident per security incident measurement, uh, and how well how broadly adopted within the most successful folks uh, specific solutions are. So uh, we'll talk about both of those things for key technologies and for key security practices in our next episode, episode three. And um, let me see. I think that brings us yeah, to the wrap up.
Terrific. So uh, we recommend that organizations uh, integrate authentication and authorization for cloud and on-premises resources with IAM as a service, and that they use CASB uh, as much to resolve blind spots as to control access to cloud resources, and uh, that they take data from any place they can get it uh, and feed that into a threat analytics solution, some kind of XDR package, uh, both to help them uh, spot bad actors and identify suspicious actions uh, as they evolve real time uh, in their networks. They should be integrating endpoint defenses uh, into the whole by deploying EDR solutions and making sure that they're feeding data from that into their XDR solution. Uh, best place to spot user behavior is on the devices users are using. Um, and that they bend their thinking towards zero trust and a software-defined perimeter, uh, adopting that zero trust principle of deny all and then allow some specifically, uh, and that they be implementing solutions that support that kind of granular control and also uh, dynamic trust maps. So things that can respond not just to what you set up in advance, but to uh, threat identification from that XDR system. And uh, that they apply cloud-style defenses to their uh, outward-facing uh, outward connectivity uh, for the big internet using things like secure web gateways as a service. Uh, and of course, your mileage will vary as to whether you also need DLP as a service and other things. Uh, but uh, getting to uh, cloud provisioning and cloud modeled delivery of those services is uh, crucial to lining yourself up to survive the next 10 years in IT and in cybersecurity. So before we head into the Q&A period, and if you have not yet, please do submit questions in the question panel. Um, I would like to draw your attention to the, um, excuse me, to the attachments tab uh, in the Bright Talk interface and invite you to register for upcoming episodes in this series. There are several more to come yet, and we'll be digging much more deeply into the data uh, in the next two or three. Also, you'll see a link to our website and our LinkedIn profiles. Please connect with us. We'd, we'd love to chat. Uh, and with that, let's get to some questions. And again, uh, at any point here, please submit more questions through the panel, but we've got some to get started with. So. Uh, you said Scape is just a marketing catch-all you made up. Yep, guilty as charged. Um, will it become a product category for reels? Uh, okay, well, uh, it seems likely to us that someone will try to fill all those functional slots for sure uh, because it's just logical. You, you, you can't stop short of the behavioral threat analytics and stop short of the endpoint as a security probe and security execution point. So you, you've pretty much got to be incorporating those things into your architecture. So yeah, someone's going to be pulling those pieces in uh, with varying degrees of cleanness and well integration. Yes, absolutely. But uh, will they use the SCAPE acronym? Probably not. I mean, let's be real. It's one syllable and simple to say. And why use one syllable when you can use two or three? Uh, it's just contrary to marketing nature. Next question, does SDP really fit here? Yes, short answer, uh, slightly longer answer. Uh, since it can be a replacement for the secure access piece of SASE and SCAPE, um, any other means of delivering that secure access piece uh, for some or all users or in combination with some other solution for the extremely paranoid, um, Yes, it, it certainly does fit and it merits calling out explicitly as a way of providing that zero trust network access uh, piece of the puzzle. Next question, and, and currently the last question. So uh, if you've got something percolating in the back of your head, now's the time to drop it in. Last question for the moment, uh, the way you describe it is XDR really just UEBA? Yes, uh, yes it is. And UEBA is just behavioral threat analytics, BTA. But again, 
why use fewer letters and fewer syllables when you can use more? Uh, we think of it internally here at Nemertes as BTA, uh, just because that's the acronym we came up with uh, and before UEBA, and it's shorter, sweeter, and a little more explicit. Uh, it's looking at behavior, and it is uh, blind to whether it's users or entities. It's looking at behavior, and it's looking at it for threat analytics. So behavioral threat analytics, short, sweet, meaningful. Uh, XDR is uh, not much worse, but a little less clear. Uh, and certainly shorter, so we're going to go with XDR uh, for the time being. And with that, no last-minute questions over the transom. With that, I will say that's what we've got time for now. Uh, thanks to everybody for your time and for these, these great questions. Uh, the replay for this session should be up in our channel shortly. If you found the session valuable, please feel free to share a link to it with your colleagues, point them to it on Bright Talk. And please take a moment to rate the webinar. It's much appreciated. If you haven't already, check out the links in the attachments tab and uh, register for future sessions. Thank you very much for joining us for today's session. And we look forward to having you join us again soon. Bye.